This is the moment Francisco Garcia finally started getting life-saving treatment. But he almost didn't make it here. He had been sick for days with worsening symptoms. <coughs> so he had three days of pains in his uh, entire body and a lot of sweating. But the construction worker and father of two refused to go to the hospital. Because one starts thinking, how am I going to pay? How is this going to be if I can't, if I can't work and I can't get a paycheck? Francisco didn't have health insurance, and because of that, has never gone to see a doctor in the U.S. Did it worry you in the early days that you had no health insurance? How was I going to pay? That fear of getting hit with a massive bill kept him from seeking help when he finally went to the ER. He was diagnosed with a severe case of COVID. One month and four days in the hospital, got COVID. By the time they come to me, they come in with one foot on the grave. Dr. Joseph Varong is a pulmonologist at Houston's United Memorial Medical Center and runs his own clinic serving the Latino community. He sees patients like Francisco all the time. Does having health insurance affect the time patients come in to see you? Absolutely. I mean, you know, I take care of people that have okay. no resources. They are concerned of the financial yeah. implications. And it's not just financial concerns keeping some Latinos from seeking health care. Many are concerned about their immigration status or fear a language barrier. I see it every day, and I have been seeing it for decades. And it's not getting better, it's getting worse. In fact, Latinos have the highest uninsured rates of any race or ethnic group in the U.S., in California, Latinos are three times more likely to be uninsured than whites. One group there is trying to change that. Community health workers at El Sol spend nearly every day going door-to-door -door in hard-hit communities and stationing at food banks to physically sign people up for government-run health insurance. It all comes down to the education. What do they know that they have access to? And that's where we come in to break those barriers and inform them, yes, you can get access to this kind of insurance. For Jose Estrada and his wife, health insurance is a luxury they say they'll never have. It's too expensive, they say. Instead, they resort to natural remedies. They suffered through COVID with no medication. And Jose believes he has early Alzheimer's, but can't even see a doctor to be diagnosed. Just how challenging is it to close this gap? For the whole day we were with them, El Sol didn't sign up a single person for insurance. But they're not giving up. It does take a long time to help our community, and it takes more than a meeting or two to be able to persuade them to get the help that they have access to. As for Francisco, he's taking it one day at a time. Now, going in for regular monthly checkups. Hopefully I can go back to how I was before. And Francisco's stay at the hospital costs thousands of dollars a day. But Dr. Varon said he convinced the hospital not to charge him because it was the right thing to do. Aaron and Morgan. Well, it was arguably the biggest breakup in music history. That's right, and half a century later, it's still causing controversy. Next up, Paul McCartney's new surprising claim about why the Beatles actually decided to disband. Stay with us. of the story, where it's actually happening, with NBC News journalists on the ground from all over the world. We cover what you need to know and bring your news feed to life. In primetime and streaming live, it's your news playlist every night. Top Story with Tom Yamas, hey, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Does the White House think they have an Afghanistan problem or a COVID problem? Mm -hmm. Do you believe the abortion issue should reflect the will of the people or the will of the elected officials? The vaccine okay. mandate. Is this going to work or is this going to backfire? If it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. It was a wealthy, okay. idyllic town That's forced to confront thing. racism. But when the school board presented its plan, it ignited a national firestorm. Critical race theory. Racism in reverse. False narrative. Shame. This is South Lake. All episodes available now. The Meet the Press Chuck Todd cast. Free wherever you get your podcasts. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. Okay. Our world is facing some complex issues. Chuck Todd breaks them down. 
Every Thursday, a deep dive into a new subject. Instead of covering a lot of topics in one show, we're going to focus on one and take a deeper look at how it impacts America. Exploring and explaining the critical stories that affect our future. Meet the Press Reports. Ooh. Thursdays at 9, streaming on NBC News Now and on demand next day on Peacock. All right, so they're still one of the most consequential groups in rock and roll history, and their breakup 50 years ago broke the hearts of music fans all around the world. And now we're learning that uh, what may have really happened to the Beatles, in a rare, candid interview, Paul McCartney talked about what and who caused the Fab Four to split. Joining us now is David Brown, senior writer for Rolling Stone. Uh, David, you're somewhat of a, a Beatles breakup expert, as I understand it, uh, and you sort of you wrote the book on this, I should say, too. This is one of the, the, the few times that we've heard Paul McCartney talk about the split of the Beatles. What's he saying? He's basically confirming uh, information that a lot of us uh, Beatle archivists have, have thought for a while, which is that in uh, the John was the first one to basically say it's over. It was a lot of that was always blamed on Paul. But uh, in the fall of 1969, there was a, a, a Beatles meeting uh, about what to do next and what to move forward with, the, how to move forward with the group. And uh, Paul was very much in favor of coming up with some ideas to keep the bond together. And it was John who said in the meeting, I want a divorce. He was fed up with it and he walked out of the meeting and they kept it quiet for months because there were business deals in the works and so forth. So this is basically Paul, uh, you know, confirming like, yes, that meeting essentially did happen. And uh, Paul himself kind of broke the news a few months later, but it, the, the roots of it were, were, were back in that fall of 69 band meeting. So now that this is out there for the rest of us to, to sort of know about, have we heard anything from, from Lennon's widow, from Yoko Ono, or, or the other surviving Beatle, Ringo Starr? They haven't. Uh, they generally don't kind of weigh in on it. I mean, Ringo, uh, when he talks about the breakup of the Beatles, he's generally pretty diplomatic, as Ringo is. And, yeah. like, one of his comments was, well, gee, I can't put my finger on any one thing of why we broke up and, and so forth. So, you know, I, I think uh, things are pretty good in that world between all those different parties and families, and I doubt anybody wants to rock the boat <laughs> that much at this point. <laughs> you know, so it, it, the, the timing of this, uh, these comments, is sort of raising some eyebrows in some places. Saturday would have been John Lennon's 81st birthday. Paul McCartney posted uh, a tribute of sorts on Instagram to that. How is the larger music world reacting to these uh, revelations, if you will? Uh, well, I think as far as the timing goes, I think it's just uh, unfortunate, unfortunate coincidence, you know, um, that, you know, Paul did wish John a happy birthday on his Instagram account, um, social media stuff the other day. And, you know, it was it was the uh, BBC that kind of coincidentally, <laughs> you know, leaked these tidbits from the information. So it was um, maybe a strange way to acknowledge John's birthday at the same time. Uh, but I think in the music world, uh, I think like a lot of people like myself say, oh, okay, you know, this confirms a lot of what we've all suspected and, and, and putting a lot of the blame just on Paul, which has been the case for uh, 51 years, uh, it may be not completely correct. All right, we'll leave it there. David Brown, senior writer at Rolling Stone. We appreciate your time today. Okay. Thanks. Thanks, Aaron. Now we know. 
Right now on NBC News Now, no vaccine required. The head of the largest sheriff's department in America says he will not require his deputies to get a COVID shot. Why he says he was forced to defy his county and the other law enforcement agencies that could soon follow suit. Back in the running, the Boston Marathon looking to put its best foot forward as it returns from its pandemic hiatus. The measure is being taken to keep runners and spectators safe. Critical condition, the COVID pandemic leading to a dire shortage of pan paramedics and EMTs. What's causing the labor crisis and why experts say it's literally a matter of life and death. And driving into history, one week after Bubba Wallace's victory at Talladega, NBC News talks exclusively with two of the legends who helped get him there. Basketball icon Michael Jordan and Daytona 500 winner Denny Hamlin. And good Monday, everybody. I'm Aaron Gilchrist. And I'm Morgan Radford. Thank you so much for joining us. We begin this hour with the fight against COVID-19 and the push to finally get back to normal life. We are now one step closer to having a pill to treat COVID-19. Merck announcing early this morning that it's applying for emergency use authorization for its antiviral drug. Trial data showing it reduces hospitalizations or death due to COVID-19 by 50%. The federal government has already placed an advance order for these pills. New COVID cases keep dropping nationwide. Only three states, Nevada, Michigan, and Minnesota, are reporting a clear uptick over the last 14 days. And it is a key week on the vaccination front. FDA advisors will discuss Moderna and J&J &J booster shots. And we're also about two weeks away from Pfizer's vaccine potentially being authorized for kids as young as five. Lots of COVID news to get into this hour. We begin with the fight over vaccine mandates for law enforcement. NBC News correspondent Steve Patterson joins us now from Los Angeles. Steve, uh, we know that there is a mandate there in, uh, in L.A. County, but there's, uh, I guess, some disagreement about enforcing it when you, we look at the sheriff's office there. What can you tell us? What's going on? Yeah, I mean, Aaron, it's as simple as the person in charge of enforcing the mandate simply will not enforce the mandate. That's the sheriff. His name is Alex Villanueva, and he says he will not, again, enforce a COVID vaccine mandate for his force operation. And this is huge. The stakes are high. You're talking about an 18,000 member sheriff's department, the largest in the country, uh, serving some 10 million people in this county. That's part of his argument, though. He's saying basically that there have been so many cutbacks in the department. Partially, he's de de uh, blaming the defund the police movement across the country for some of those cutbacks, for the fact that there have been hiring freezes. So what, in essence, he's saying that if he were to enforce this policy, that would mean he would lose another 5 to 10 percentage of his force, something that he says he simply cannot do. He said there just wouldn't be an option for that. Uh, and so, and in fact, he's saying he will not enforce the mandate. Here's exactly what he said in his language, in his verbiage, uh, about why he will not enforce this. Listen to this. I'm not forcing anyone. The, the issue has become so politicized there are entire groups of employees that are willing to be fired and laid off rather than get vaccinated. You hear his reasoning there, and you also maybe look at the numbers and say, okay, yeah, there have been some cutbacks, so maybe it's a bit reasonable. But then on the other side, you look at some of the behavior he's exhibited before. In July, there was a mass mandate for the entire county. That's something he wouldn't enforce either. And there, he cited the science, saying that it wasn't correct, that it didn't gel with the policies that they didn't need to enforce. So again, experts looking at this on both sides, but it really stands to this, that he will not enforce this mandate, guys. So it, back to you, before we move on, Steve, is that does that is that where the buck stops? Is there no one above him who could then enforce it? Is this, this a done deal for them? I mean, look, Aaron, he is the chief enforcement officer for the entire county. The buck does stop with him. If he chooses not to enforce that, essentially, that's where this rests. There hasn't been any sort of legislation or legislative body to challenge him on this so far. So it stands at this point until, again, there's another election. Aaron? Uh, let's look at Seattle. The, the, there's a mandate for law enforcement there that's already been pushed back to the 18th. What, if, uh, what happens if officers don't show their proof in the coming days in Seattle? Seattle, again, another looming deadline. You're looking at a thousand member force there. Uh, right now, as it stands, there's about a third of that police department that says they haven't exactly said that they won't do it, but they, what they haven't shown is proof 
of a fully vaccinated body, which essentially means those officers are looking at being fired, which is, again, a big deal for that department because that means that call response times could be cut down. And essentially, as a backup, what they would do is institute a policy which would have everybody in the entire police department being put on 911 calls. So you'd have detectives that are used to office duty. You'd have training officers. They would all be, again, responding to those 911 calls. Uh, the uh, police union there spoke out about what's happening uh, in that situation. Want to hear what they said. Listen to this. Please look yourself in the mirror and ask, are you doing the right thing by removing people who are willing to continue to serve this community? COVID is now one of the leading causes of death for first responders, yet this is happening in more than just Seattle and L.A. It's happening in Washington State, in Oregon, in Chicago. There's a big battle really all over the country and something that looks like it's not slowing down anytime soon. Back to you. All right, Steve Patterson for us in L.A. Steve, thank you. Meanwhile, here on the East Coast, a tradition returns today. Thousands of people are taking part in the Boston Marathon. That's where we find NBC News correspondent Shaquille Brewster, who's along the course with all those cheers and smiles and signs there, Shaq. What's the feeling out there today? You described it, Morgan. You have the cheering, you have the cowbells, you have the signs. People, we're about 22 miles into this race here, so you have people and fans and spectators trying to give whatever energy they can to these runners who have about four more miles until they reach the finish line. So you have that excitement there, and look, part of it is because this is a big event in Boston every single year. That's, of course, except for the past two years. This is an event that was delayed from the spring when it normally takes place uh, this year, and then the year before, it was canceled because we were in the heart or at the beginning of the pandemic so you have people who are saying they're excited that this is back and they say that this one is extra special because they weren't able to experience it before listen to what a few fans told me honestly it feels really amazing seeing everyone just like rally around together and like it's been postponed so it just feels it feels very good to be here and to see everyone cheering on the runners so i'm very happy to be here Seeing everyone like come together and you know have something that like the city can celebrate and do is kind of cool and awesome. I've lived here all my life. This is the first time I've come in, and it really felt special this year to come in. You know, because it's getting a little bit more back to being with everybody and being able to enjoy it safely and you know the best that we can. So, but it's great. It really is. Morgan, just so you get an idea of how big this is, I know you know this from going to school here, but people take the day off for this marathon each and every year. So the fact that it wasn't there for two years, people notice that, and the fact that it's back and people can come out and cheer on these runners, uh, they notice it as well, Morgan. No, this is like the Super Bowl for Boston, man. I mean, this is a, this is a big deal. You got a lucky assignment today, my man. So, so tell us, what steps have been taken to really make this race as COVID safe as possible? Because the world has been looking forward to this, to moments like this that sort of just signal a small return to normalcy. But how are we doing it safely, Shaq? That's the theme that you hear from so many people. They feel like this is turning the corner. And, you know, in terms of the safety precautions, some of them you can see. You can see some of the runners here. It's not as congested as a marathon would be, especially at this juncture. We're past the elite group of runners. These are people who are just running their race right now, trying to wrap this up. So it's not as congested. They had a rolling start time to limit that uh, congestion there. And every runner that you see here has either presented a negative COVID test or that proof of vaccination. Another thing to consider, I mean, this is an outdoor event. We're in an area where uh, it's about 70% of the population uh, is fully vaccinated. You have almost 80% of the population with at least one dose of the vaccine. So you talk to doctors, you talk to experts here, they say this is a pretty safe event and they're happy that they can come out, do this safely. It's a sign people are hoping that we're finally turning that corner of this pandemic. Of course, you have doctors saying it makes it, it depends on whether or not you have folks still getting that vaccination, Morgan. All right, Shaq. Well, I'm going to let you go back and get to the fun because I hear those cowbells going off behind you. I'm going you. back to cheering. <laughs> <laughs> you need to go back to running, man. I want to see you on that track next time. I want to see oh, with the big number on the front of your chest. A little Superman sign. <laughs> uh, let's go together. <laughs> okay, that's fine. You raise me one. I'll sign up with you. Thanks so much, Shaq. I appreciate you. <laughs>
I will stand on the sideline and clap. I, just, I got you. You're the cheering squad. I'm here this. for got it. it. <laughs> Let's bring in Dr. Shoshana Angeleiter now. She's an internal medicine physician at California Pacific Medical Center in San Francisco. Uh, Doc, a few questions for you today. I want to start with Merck uh, and this, this effort to get the FDA approval for the drug to treat COVID-19, the emergency use authorization. Uh, how is this going to help in, in with what we're dealing with right now with patients who are infected with COVID? And what's the timeline for approval on a drug like this? Well, Aaron, this is certainly exciting news. And uh, this medicine is, is in a pill form, which is convenient and relatively cheap, which people can take at home, of course. And it does appear to markedly reduce hospitalization and death if taken when you have symptoms of COVID-19. You know, at this point, the drug maker said they're seeking authorization for the pill to be given only to high-risk adults, so people over 60, younger people with underlying medical problems. It's not clear whether the treatment is going to be available for vaccinated people at the start. Um, I do want to point out, though, that, that vaccination remains our most powerful tool uh, to control this pandemic. It can prevent you, of course, from getting COVID in the first place. And the goal should always be to prevent infection. Uh, but we're certainly moving toward a future where vaccines and these non-pharmaceutical interventions and progress in research like these breakthroughs and, and other antivirals in the pipeline can allow us to, re to return to a more normal life. In terms of the timeline, uh, it, it's yet to be seen, so stay tuned. You know, we've talked a lot about the ups and downs that we're seeing with infection rates in this country, and now the CDC uh, is putting out data that shows we have six states that are reporting an increase of cases over the past two weeks, uh, a significant improvement from what we talked about in September. What's behind this, this nationwide improvement, do you think? Well, the U.S. is down 40% in new cases since last month. This is good news as we head into the fall and the winter. But sadly, we're still at high levels of deaths. We do have a handful of states for which uh, there are fairly high infection rates. They're in areas where the weather is turning colder. None of them have high enough levels of vaccination. Um, this is problematic because we know that this virus spreads most quickly when unvaccinated people spend time unmasked indoors. I think, Aaron, we need to look back at the recent history in the U.S. and around the world and, and notice that COVID tends to have about a two-month cycle where we often see a 60-day surge followed by a retreat and then another surge. And honestly, we don't know why this is. Now, what we do know is that this virus and, and the Delta variant in particular is going to exploit any gaps in immune protection. We saw that this summer. So as we look ahead to the colder months, the holidays, about two months from now, no one can say for sure what's coming. But in, I think until we have many more people fully vaccinated, including our young children, we need to proceed with caution, not declare victory prematurely again. Well, you know, speaking of children and holidays, Dr. Anthony Fauci yesterday said that uh, trick-or-treating this year is perfectly safe. Uh, I want to play a little bit of what he had to say. You can get out there. You're outdoors for the most part, at least when my children were out there doing trick-or-treating. Um, and enjoy it. I mean, this is a time that children love. It's a good time to reflect on why it's important to get vaccinated. But go out there and enjoy Halloween as well as the other holidays. So, Doc, what's your advice for parents to keep their kids as safe as possible and, and celebrate Halloween? Aaron, kids love Halloween. Heck, I love Halloween. It's a great holiday, but I think we need to be smart. We know that staying outdoors, keeping distance from people that we don't know, and masking are the best ways to reduce the risk of viral transmission. So if the question is, can my child dress up and go trick-or-treating outside, staying away from crowds like parades or packed streets? Yes. Is it risky for children, especially unvaccinated younger ones and families, to attend indoor parties, especially with people they don't know and with unknown vaccination status? Yeah, that's risky. Um, but by doing the things that we know work to reduce the risk, there are, are certainly ways to have a fun and safe Halloween this year. All right, Dr. Shoshana Angelaida, we appreciate your time and perspective today. Thank you. Thanks, Aaron. Meanwhile, President Biden is heading back to the White House tonight as his administration is starting staring down multiple looming economic crises. Just last week, Senate leaders Chuck Schumer and Mitch McConnell reached a last-second agreement to prevent the U.S. from defaulting on its debt. But that deal only lasts until December 3rd. Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen is warning that a longer-term solution is needed. There's an enormous amount at stake. Uh, a failure to raise the debt ceiling would probably cause a recession and could even result in a financial crisis. It would be a catastrophe. 
All right, so joining us now, we have NBCNews.com senior White House reporter Shannon Pettypiece, who joins me now. Uh, Shannon, on Friday, Senator McConnell sent a letter to President Biden saying that his party will not help Democrats on a debt limit increase come December. So what does the White House want Democrats to do to really ensure that a default does not happen? Yeah, there was a bit of a sigh of relief here a few days ago in Washington when it looked like we weren't going to hit uh, this cliff and the government was going to run out of money to pay its bills. Um, now, we have a little bit of breathing room there, but the same problem remains. The White House position on this has been that they are going to try and shift the messaging, put the blame on Republicans to whatever extent they can to try and force them to the table. However, the White House does not want to get into a negotiating back and forth with Republicans about this either. They don't want the debt ceiling to be something that can be used as a political football or a bargaining chip. Uh, so behind the scenes, there aren't really any negotiations or talks going on with Republicans. It's mostly a public pressure campaign hoping that Republicans and Democrats are going to be able to find a solution to this on the Hill. Otherwise, it is still an option for the Republicans to try and go it alone on this. Well, speaking of that, Congress is mostly out of session this week, meaning that not much is actually getting done on the president's agenda. So where do things stand on the infrastructure and the reconciliation bills? Yeah, you know, there was so much attention at the end of the month, trying last month, September, trying to hammer through a deal by a sort of artificial deadline that the Democrats in Congress had put in place. Uh, that has uh, the sort of the tension, some of the pressure, the momentum behind that has waned a little bit, but they still understand this is something that the president wants to and needs to really get done by the end of the year. A big okay. focus right now is Let on the price tag, uh, how much is it going to be for, and when okay. you're talking about trying to cut back on the price tag, you've got to talk about what programs you want to cut back in there. So that's really one of the real difficult decisions and conversations Democrats are having right now amongst themselves. And let's speak about the Republicans just for one more moment here, Shan. I mean, we also heard from former President Trump at a rally in Iowa just over the weekend. Can you give us a sense just briefly about, you know, what he said? Well, Iowa, notable, uh, as many political observers would know, as one of the first in the state uh, caucuses, uh, someplace that potential presidential candidates usually go, out there with a rally, uh, as we have seen so many times from him before, and continuing to put pressure out there on Republicans to answer a lot of difficult questions. Here's an exchange over the weekend uh, with Representative Steve Scalise. Do you think the 2020 election was stolen from Donald Trump. Well, Chris, I've been very clear from the beginning. If you look at a number of states, they didn't follow their state passed laws that governed the election for president. We so you think rules. the election was so stolen? I, I, stolen? I, what I said is there are states that didn't follow their legislatively set rules. So with President Trump out there, I'm sorry, former President Trump out there increasingly visible, those are the type of questions that are going to remain that Republicans in his party are going to have to answer to. All right, Shannon Pettypiece for us there, live from the White House.